Praise God. By the grace of God, yesterday we began with the, the, the world to come. And we touched on the kingdom era. The kingdom era that we are going to reign and rule with Christ in the next age. That is why the Bible said that the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints. And Hebrews 2 5 said, And unto the angels has he not put into subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. So we learned that there is a world to come whereof we speak. You see, he said, but one in a certain place testify it, saying, What is man that thou art so mindful of him, and the son of man that thou hast him? The next age is given to men. And yesterday, by the grace of God, we saw some of the characteristics of the age to come. Praise God. The age to come. How many of you were blessed yesterday? Hallelujah. Yesterday I made a statement that um, in the next age, that is in the kingdom age, there's going to be a temple. If you could remember, the temple. The temple is different. It's very detailed. It's more detailed than the rest of the temples in scripture. It's more detailed. It's more detailed. The side chambers, the four corner courts, it's more detailed. The six steps into the inner chamber, the eight steps, it's very detailed. But we said that temple has a brazen altar, but it doesn't have a lot of things. It doesn't have a lampstand. It doesn't have the show braid. It doesn't have the hot, the Ark of the Covenant, you see. But it has the brazen altar. Hmm. The brazen altar is an altar of brass. In the Bible, brass signifies judgment. You see, the brazen altar actually symbolizes the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is actually the brazen altar. Because the cross signifies judgment. It is a brazen altar. An altar of brass. Brass is for judgment. On the cross, he bore our judgment in our state. And the brazen altar was for the sin offering. It's for the, it was for the sin offering. The death of Christ is the landmark of the ages. It's a landmark of the ages. The scope and the span of the effect of his death on the cross is eternally efficacious. It is forever. It is not time bound. Therefore, in the age to come, there will still be a remembrance of the work of Christ and what he did and his death on the cross. But that age, there will be sinners in that age. Isaiah, Isaiah 65. Yesterday we saw from verse 17 going downward to the end. The Bible speaks of sinners. There shall be sinners. You know, people, the Bible said that the sinner being 100 years will be accursed. So there will still be sin offering in those days. That is why the brazen altar will be needed. So one of the great punishments for the sinner at that time is that when you, when you are a sinner, you die at age 100. And that is the age of a little child. That is the age of a little child. Isaiah 33. Verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. And this is a prophecy concerning the, the, the kingdom age. Okay, the kingdom age. Now when you read the Bible, you realize that a lot of the things concerning the kingdom age, we apply it to. We use our scriptures and we make it applicable to our time. There are diverse ways you can interpret scriptures. There's the literal interpretation. For instance, when you're approaching the scripture, the literal interpretation of the scripture is actually the kingdom era. It's not our time. It's not our time. But, you know, every scripture has a twofold sidedness in Revelation. Although it is literal, it has its figurative application. That's how we can by faith also appropriate it to our lives. So he said, Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Now, what is Zion? Well, when we look at Zion, Zion, if we say Zion is the church, correct, whereas that is just 40%. It says a partial definition. <laughs> because in the Old Testament, 
Zion, Solomon was even called Zion. The city of David was called Zion. You see. In our age, the church is Zion. In the next age, the kingdom era is Zion. So Zion is a metamorphosis. You see. So, Zion here, in literal interpretation, is not talking about the church. It's talking about the next age. So look upon Zion. You see. The city of our solemnities, of festivities. Then I shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation. <laughs> you know, it's against the present state of Jerusalem, the, the multitude of wars. A quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of his sticks shall ever be removed. That shall the cut thereof be broken. So he's talking about Jerusalem, how it shall be in those, in those days. A quiet habitation, it shall be formidable, strong. Nothing shall shake the peace of Jerusalem. But look at the next verse. But there, the glorious Lord will be unto us, unto us, a place of broad rivers and streams, where rain shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. For our Lord is our judge, for Jehovah is our Lord giver. Jehovah is our king. He will save us. Their tacklings are loose. They could not strength, well strengthen them, their mast. They could not spread the seal. Then is the prey of a great spot divided, and a limb take the prey. The inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. So this is applicable to the kingdom era. You see. And this is what is going to happen. He said, There, the Lord of glory, King James will say the glorious Lord, but it's actually the Lord of glory will be unto us a place of broad rivers. Hmm. This is very figurative. The Lord, the, 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 the Lord of glory will be unto us at that time a place of broad rivers. Wherein, he <laughs> said, wherein shall go no galley. Galley is a boat. You know, galley is a no galley with oars. Galley is a boat, you know. And you know the oars. Galley is a boat. Where shall go no galley with oars. Neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. Gallant ships are mega ships. Now, the Bible says, Oh, glory will be grievous. And number one, there wouldn't be boats with oars. I hope you know what oars is. So what's, it, it shows us the kind of life that will be in the next age. You know, in Isaiah's day, when the boat is on the top of the seas, it is motioned by two means or by two ways. Number one, either you use the oars to direct the movement of the boat. Now when you use the oars, that means you are using human energy, human strength. You are enlisting human activity. So you can propel it by your own energy. You can navigate it by your own course. You can choose to move at your own pace, wherever you want to go at your own time. The next way of moving the ship, sorry, the, the, oar, the, the galley or the boat, was to wait for the movement of the wind. There were powerful, fierce winds. That will, but in Azai's day, they will strategize and position the galley in such a way that when the winds blew, it will just motion it forward. But that one, you cannot propel it by your human energy. You need faith and patience to wait for the direction and the movement of the wind, for the wind to come at its time to motion it forward. Hmm. But as I prophesied and said, on that day, there wouldn't be boats with oars. <laughs> that means that men are not, are not, are not going to, you know, boat with oars. Men are, not, men are not go, no longer going to navigate their own courses. Move by their, by their own ways, by their own direction. As they will. They will wait on the Lord by faith and by patience. The Lord will motion them whenever he wants, wherever he wants to. The heavenly wind will, will, will be their sailing power. The wind blow it where it listed. They will know it is a spirit. They will wait for the movement of the wind. And they will wait for the direction of the spirit. Move. So it will characterize the next age. 
The Bible said that there shall be no gallant ships. Gallant ships are for the oceans. They are not for the rivers. There shall be no gallant ships. They are not for the rivers. Gallant ships will actually block the flow of the, of the smaller boats and the smaller galley. You, you understand? That's how it's going to be. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. So you see the kind of life it shall be in those days. <laughs> One thing with gallant ships is that gallant ships or the heavy ships, according to the book of James 3 verse 4, the Bible said that behold, <laughs> the, the great ships. <laughs> the Bible said that they are moved about by fierce winds. <laughs> Yet they are turned about by a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. That means that, you know, these great ships on the sea, they are first motioned by fierce winds. Yet there's a small helm, and the Bible said, though they are first motioned by fierce winds, the governor with a small helm, whether whatever he pleases or he listed, he can turn a small helm to motion it forward. That means that it, spe- it bespeaks of being led by the Spirit, but after you are led by the Spirit, you govern your own way. Moved about by the winds, but yet after that, they are not by the small helm. Wait, wherever. James, what pleases. Wherever the governor pleases to move. The Lord said, on that day, there wouldn't be gallant ships. There wouldn't be people who will begin in spirit and they will be made perfect. People will not be, begin in the spirit and they will end in the flesh. It shall not be on that day. But the heavenly wind will blow us. We are gliding. Just be glided. And we will glide by the heavenly firmament, by the wind of the spirit. Lord say east, we are just turned east by his wind. West, we turn west by his wind. South, we turn, we turn south. Not that, not that we premeditate where we want to go, but we are vulnerable to the ways of the spirit. Motion by the way of the spirit. Hallelujah. And I'm seeing a people who will foretaste of the powers of the age to come. The powers of the age to come. They have a foretaste, a glimpse, a glimmer, a flames. The taste of the powers of the world to come. Beloved, we can have fellowship and we can participate, experience the powers of that age in the present time. The Lord, the glorious Lord, the Lord of glory, was a place of broad rivers. And we would no longer use galleys and oars to maneuver and manipulate and the gates and compass our own but the lord shall be our guide the lord shall be our savior he shall be our lawgiver the lord the lord the lord the lord the lord the lord hallelujah it shall be and we will participate in that reality before the time comes The inhabitants of that land shall not say, I am sick. <laughs> the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. They will not say, I am sick. <laughs> they will not say, I am sick. But we live in that reality today. Even in Jesus' name, the Son of God. But today I didn't come to talk about the kingdom era. I come to take, talk about another era. Another era. Paul said, in the fullness of the dispensations of times, in the fullness of Hallelujah. In the fullness of the oikodomia of the ages, in the fullness of the economy of the times. Fullness. Where would that come? In the fullness At the, of the great white throne judgment. The old creation ended. The times would have ended. They will begin eternity. The eternity begins. Eternity begins. And we bless God that he has hidden things in the Bible so that we can access them. Eternity begins. 
eternity begins, reveals to us how the millennium, the millennium, Revelation 20. But in Revelation 20, we pass the kingdom age. So let, let's now pass the kingdom age and get to Revelation chapter 21. Are you there? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw a new heaven. And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. What is the first heaven and what is the first earth? Hmm. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. They were passed away. How did they pass away? What is the first heaven and what is the first earth? When the Bible uses the, the, the Greek word pass away, that Greek origin means to move, to be ushered, to move from one condition to another condition. You see, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, actually it means they were ushered into another condition altogether. Shed into another condition. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Hmm. I wish you were the one seeing this vision. Hmm. And I saw. And there was no more sea. There will be sea in the kingdom era. There will be no more sea in eternity. In the kingdom era, there will be sea. Because the kingdom era is the age of restoration. It is not. Eternity is part of the old creation, restoration. It's part of God's coming that will usher us into the new Jerusalem or eternity. There was no more sea. Hmm. About the heaven and the, the heavens and the earth of the kingdom era, there was a sea. Why no more sea? Why no more sea? Whenever you see the sea, it reminds us of a fallen race. It reminds us of a fallen race. The sea you can see today, do you know the origin of the sea? The seas we see are the pre Adamic flood waters. They were the waters of judgment by which God destroyed. 
the pre adamic world these were the same waters god didn't create any new water check the bible in genesis chapter 1 god was renovating a world god was not creating a world so there were waters already because the earth was submerged in water <laughs> And God separated the waters above the firmament and the waters below it. He just separated the waters. The whole universe was. Praise God. And you see, the pre Adamic living creatures, they were judged by being disembodied. And in their judgment, they were lodged, were kept in the abusus which actually has to do with the sea because the sea is the entrance to the great abusus is the sea it is the sea that is why the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters the face of the great great deep he moved upon the face of the waters Hallelujah. Now, at the great white throne judgment, what will happen is, is that in Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that hell and Hades will give up its inhabitants, and the sea will also give up it. Who are the inhabitants the sea will give? It is not those who died in the sea. Those who died in the sea who were not born again are in hell already. And hell will give them up. The Bible is not talking about dead bodies. If the Bible was talking about dead bodies, like those who died in the land, the land should give up the dead. Because more people have died in the land. When the Bible talks about the sea, the Bible is talking about the lodging place of demons. White throne judgment is the judgment of the ages. It's not only the judgment of the Adamic era. It's also the judgment of the pre-Adamic era. Those who are in hell, have, been, have they been judged? <laughs> they are in hell already, yet they shall be judged. In the pre-Adamic race, some are in Tartarus, some are in Hades, some are in Abusos, yet the great final judgment, they shall all come up to stand before the great white throne judgment. They'll all come up. Those in hell, and those, all those in the lower regions, the, 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 the regions of the earth, and those lower compartments, they will come up finally. And God will sit on a white throne judgment. Jesus. Praise God. And it will be the lake of fire. The Bible said, Peter said, the second epistle which I now write unto you, in both which I stay your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you should be mindful of the word which was spoken by the Holy Prophet, and of us, the commandment of the apostles of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Knowing this, that there shall come scoffers in the last days, who will walk after their own last, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have unto this day. But this day, <laughs> willingly are ignorant of common that by the word of the Lord the heavens and the earth were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished by the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto judgment against the day of perdition and the destruction of ungodly men. But ye, beloved, be not ignorant of this, that with the Lord a day is a thousand, and a thousand days but one day. Hmm. Praise God. He is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all will come to repentance. But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in that which the heavens shall pass away with great noise. And the heavens also shall be bent with fervent heat. And the earth and the works that are therein, the Bible said that they shall be bent, and the element they shall be bent. 
Now, the Bible talks about the world that then was. It was overflowed with water and it perished. The world that then was, was with water. This day, willingly, are ignorant of. The word is lantano. That means it has been hidden from their eyes. It's not Noah's flood. Noah's flood is not hidden from our eyes. Hidden from their eyes. The word ignorance is lantano. Something that is kept secret. And the earth was turning out of water and in water. It denotes baptism. That water was in the earth and the earth was, was water. That is not what happened in the West Day. This one was, is greater. You know. It overflowed with water and it perished. But the Bible said the heavens and the earth which are now. By the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. So the two worlds, there is water and fire. So the consummate eternal judgments, which will take place at the white throne, will be the dual food mingling of water and fire. That is why it is called lake of fire. It's a past race and a present race put together. Hallelujah. So it will be the lake of fire. There is water and there is fire. The universal trash can. A trash can of the universe. <laughs> hmm. Praise God. And there was no more sea. <laughs> no more fallen rays. No more demons lodging in the waters. No more. No more. No more. Praise God. No more. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city. And I, John, saw the holy city. And I, John, saw the holy city. Now, why is it called holy city? Why the term holy? Why the term holy? Now, it is holy because <laughs> this positionally and positionally, it is the composition of God's own intrinsic being and God's own self. The city, that city, <laughs> my God, you know, is the holy city. Say the holy city. You know, holiness is not the absence of sin. Holiness is not sinless perfection. Holiness in its original way, origin or root word, origin, is otherness or apartness. It's separation from all that is common. So commonness is what is opposed to holiness. But righteousness is opposed to sin. Commonness, you see. Holiness is that which is not common. And in the universe, everything is common. This fan is common. This light is common. Your shirt is common. You, the human being, crowd, is common. Everything is common. Only one thing is not common. God. That's why only God is holy. God is not common. Now, that city is not a common city. <laughs> that city is a holy city. Hmm. You see, holy, because that city, Motofarata, <laughs> Festakatakata, Oh, Maratasa, is the holy city. You know what that city is? That city is the very organic blueprint. The organic bl blueprint and the architectural plan of the triune God. It is God's ultimate eternal inten intentions from the beginning. What God sought to get in the eternal past is what he shall achieve in the eternal future. <laughs> It is God's own organic masterpiece of the ages. <laughs> Why do I use the word organic? <laughs> You'll understand. It's all that God has dreamt and has dreamt for. All that God is working. Jesus said, my father worketh, hitherto I work. Why is the father working? All that he's doing, his deliberate, determinate intentions, his counsel, all that he's doing is for that city. And that city is composed of God's own being. Goes God's own self is holy, positionally and dispositionally. 
inclinationally, <laughs> in proclivity, in the city is God's own composition. You'll understand as we go on. So the city is called holy. There has never been the like. It's holy. It's, since the city is all of God, it's separation from all, all other things. All that the city is, is all that God is. So it is called holy. Then it is called city. Why is it city? Now, and I saw the holy city. He began by saying, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So there is the new heaven, the new earth. There will be the new earth, the new heaven, and the new city. Before we end, you understand that the new earth is like the outer court. The new heaven is like the holy place. The new Jerusalem or the new city will be the holiest of holies. The holiest of all. You will understand before we finish. The holiest of all. Why is it a city? Paul said, here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That's what we are seeking for. That's the city we are seeking for. We seek one to come. For he has prepared unto them a city. That is the city. There's the new earth. The new earth, who will be in the new earth, will understand that those who pass through, the human beings in the lower, yesterday we understood that the kingdom era is made up, the, the, made up of the lower section and the upper section. In the lower section, those who accede the judgment, those who will pass through, because Satan will come and deceive the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, those who remain, untainted from his deception are those who are going to come in to the new earth. Praise God. And they are still men, yet they have come to the new earth. We'll talk about them. Then there is the new heaven, the new heaven, which is like paradise, which is, which is the country, yet there is the city, which is the metropolis. Is the metropol- the, news, the holy city is the metropolis of the heavenly country. Yes. Hallelujah. It's the center of events. The holiest. <laughs> the holinesses of holinesses. Holy city. What's, what does it say again? And I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem. It's used in a position. The holy city is a new Jerusalem. New Jeru- Jerusalem. Why does he say new Jerusalem? Why does he use the word new? See, in the New Testament, anything that is new has the composition of God. Why are we the new creation? And why are they called the old creation? The old creation is the old creation because it's just a creation without God. It's a creation apart from God, although it was God who created it. But the new creation, if there is God, there is no oldness. You see, the new creation has God as its center, its circumference. God as its nature. God as its being. God as its essence. Therefore, because everything is the constitution and the composition of God, it never grows old. That's why there's a new covenant. There's a new creation. There's a new Jerusalem. God is the... (laughs) Eternal newness. <laughs> He's the everlasting contemporary. <laughs> God is eternally modern. God never grows old. His nature that never grows old. There is no oldness in God. There is ancientness in God. Ancientness is different from oldness. <laughs> Hallelujah. The new Jerusalem is a new Jerusalem. New. After the old Jerusalem, although it's going to be renewed, yet it's old. It's part of the old creation system. But this new Jerusalem, it's called Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? It's from two words, Jerus and Salem. Salem means peace. Jerus is a corruption from Jebus, Jebus, because it was a stronghold of the Jebusites. Jerus means foundation. You see, foundation or habitation. Then Salem is peace. So Jerusalem is the foundation of peace. So the new Jerusalem is the new foundation of peace.
That's why in Galatians chapter 4, 22 to 25, the Bible talks about the Jerusalem which is above. Jerusalem which is above is the mother of us all. Jerusalem which is above is the mother of us all. Jerusalem which is above. The Bible also says that we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem. That's the Jerusalem which is above. That Jerusalem never grows old. That Jerusalem never waxes old. Hallelujah. You know, God told in the book of Deuteronomy, He said, The place which I will choose out as a name and put my name on it, that's the place which I worship. And He chose Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a place God has chosen and a place God has put, placed His name on, on that place as an acceptable place of worship. The new Jerusalem is God's choicest. God's eternal choice. God's ultimate choice is the choice of the ages. The choice of the ages. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Coming down from God out of heaven. Hey. <laughs> coming down that means that you see God's plan for us to be on earth <laughs> is eternal heaven is not God's plan for us heaven is a tentative <laughs> it's tentative it's a temporal place for the escaping of the human spirit to await the resurrection of his body so they can come back to the earth to reign with Christ for a thousand years, so that they can be in the heaven of the earth, which will be the center of the new Jerusalem, the very Ghana and the ban of God. <laughs> hmm. The new Jerusalem will come down. It will come down. Hallelujah. He, it is, he saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God of heaven. Out of heaven. You know, it, it suspend before it comes down. In the kingdom era, it suspends. But after that, when there's no more old Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem comes down. You see, the old Jerusalem will be the center, the metropolis of the kingdom era. Praise God. The heavenly Jerusalem, which is the city, presently, is the metropolis of the heavenly countries. But when it comes out as a new Jerusalem, it becomes a celestial and a terrestrial centric cosmopolis of the universe. Not just the metropolis, but also the cosmopolis. Theocentric, God centered, because that's where it is the holiest of all. Both terrestrial and celestial. It's the center of all things. Hallelujah. That's the new Jerusalem. Coming down. Coming down out of God. From God out of heaven. Prepared as a bride. Adorned for her husband. Hmm. Paid. So it's a prepared city. Prepared. Now God has been preparing that city for the past 6,000 years. When God made Adam, God had a new Jerusalem in mind. So you realize that even Eden is a, a portrait of the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem had in mind. Prepared as a bride adorned for his husband. In effect, the new Jerusalem is, is a mystical city because... You see, it's not just, the new Jerusalem is not just a material city. It's a bride. When we go further, say, come and let me show the lamb's wife. And the lamb's city. The lamb's wife was a city. Now, you should, in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus sent the to his servant John to signify. Now, he used the word all the truth 
revelations since he gave to John to signify. He used the word signify. That means him by means of signs. Why in Revelation chapter 2, the church was a lampstand. He saw a lampstand, but that was a church. But it was, it was a sign. The church was a lampstand. It was a sign. The messengers of the church were stars. So it was a sign. Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is a harlot. Beast. So it's a sign. It's a sign. So we see it was signified. It came by signs. Therefore, the need also has a sign. The mystery. From the scriptures, it will be a city, yet it's a woman. <laughs> so a woman. It's a bride. Amazingly, Mystery Babylon is a prostitute, but in them is a bride. With one husband. <laughs> with one husband. <laughs> hmm. Praise God. Why? Who is that bride? Who is that bride? It won't take time. You may say it's the church. That is only 30%. This bride is not the bride Paul was speaking about. It's more than the bride Paul was speaking about in his epistles. Because a man shall leave. His father shall be joined to his wife. And they twins shall be one flesh. So this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. That is the foundation for this one. That is the seed for this one. Do you know that the bride Paul spoke about writings? You see, John the Baptist said, He that has the bride is the bridegroom. Then in the next verse, in verse 30, he said, Of his increase. So we know that the bride is the increase of Christ. Because as Eve came out of Adam, Adam was increased. As the church came out of Christ, Christ was increased. You see, there's a corn of seed that fell into the ground, but when it was terminated and decomposed, it came out as many grains. So the bride is his increase. But the bride is clothed with Christ as his righteousness. In a church age, the bride is clothed with Christ as his righteousness. But in the next age, the bride is not clothed with Christ as his righteousness. The bride is clothed with his own works. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, the bride is clothed with his own works. Which bride is that? Now, <laughs> praise God. Now, let's talk about this bride. But before then, I want to say that, that the same bride is also a mother. A mother be a now because this Jerusalem is a mother of us all, yet it's also a bride. How come? <laughs> Praise God. In Revelation chapter 12, a sign in heaven, it was, it was, and a great wonder that appeared in a woman that was clothed with a sun, crowned with a us. And the moon was under her feet. And the woman <laughs> was in pain. And she travailed to bring, forth, to bring forth. And the Bible says she brought forth a man child that was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. This mystical woman, who is this woman? Now, this woman, according to Isaiah 66, this woman is Zion. Because he said, as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth the children. It was prophesied about this woman. Because in Isaiah 66, we saw that. Zion was also traveling. Zion was pain to be delivered. And Zion brought forth a man child in Isaiah 66. This woman brought forth a man child. It's a prophecy. You see. And the Bible said, Who has heard such a thing and who has seen such things? Can the earth be made to bring forth at once? Or can a nation be born in one day? But as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. This woman is Zion. Praise God. Take time to read Isaiah 66. But you see, I said Zion is a metamorphosis. This woman is crowned with 12 crowns, which bespeaks of the age, the parallel ages. 
the age of the patriarchs. This woman is clothed with a which typifies the dispensation of grace. This woman has subdued the moon under her feet, which speaks of the law. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the thing. 10 verse 1. The law reflects the light. It's a reflection of grace, which is the sun. In Psalm 84 verse 11, it said, The Lord is the sun. He will give his grace. Grace is actually the sun. Beloved, but the law, which is the moon, reflects the light of grace, which is the sun. This woman is clothed with three dispensations, the patriarchal ages. He's clothed with the age of grace, and he's also subduing the age of the law. And this woman, the Bible said, she is a woman. Why? Because she's the mother of us all. She's the mother of the patriarchal ages. She's the mother of the age of grace. She's the mother of the age of the law. She's the mother of Sarah, out of whom came Ishmael, out of whom came Isaac. She's the mother of Hagar, out of whom came Ishmael. And Paul said, Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. Praise God. So who is this woman? This woman is the total aggregate and <laughs> of all the redeemed of all ages since the first man stepped upon the face of the earth. It's the total aggregate of all the redeemed, the consummate of all who have ever served God since the beginning until the last day. This aggregation actually is this woman. Hallelujah. So it's not just the church, but it's also those who have gone before us. Including Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And all of that race, they will be part of that bride. This woman is all of us together. Praise God. That's that woman. And that woman also becomes a bride on that day. Why the, what is the principle of a bride? Hmm. You see, a bride is for a day, but a wife is for a lifetime. See, with the Lord, a day is a thousand, and a thousand is one day. The principle of one day before God is a thousand years. The church oh, will be a bride for the, for the kingdom era, but after the kingdom era, we assume the place of a wife. Because a wife is not for a day, a wife is for a lifetime. As a bride, adorned. Hmm. You see, the adornment of a bride is found in Revelation 19, verse 8. <laughs> that adornment <laughs> are prepared as a bride. So, God, hmm. in New Jerusalem, we don't, listen, let's enter the New Jerusalem like that. We become the New Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a becoming. It's a mere entry. It's a becoming. That's why it's a mystery. Hmm. That's what the Bible said. In whom also ye are built together for an habitation of the Spirit. In whom also the whole temple fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord. The whole building. Now, that's Ephesians chapter 1, verse, chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. You know. Now, in. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He also has living stones. <laughs> the Bible said we are built up a spiritual house. The building, we have been built to be the new Jerusalem. Now listen to me. In the kingdom age, those who are not matured in the age of Greece will have to be matured in the age of the kingdom. Those who could not, in, in the age God has his dealings in the age of grace. Yet, there are some believers who are not fully mature up to God's standard. Because God doesn't just want to people heaven with sons. That's not God's aim. God's aim is not sons. God's aim is sonship. 
sonship is the fullest expression of his son. And we all come to the full expression of his son. You see, he is the prototype and we are his duplication. We have his life, but we must have his living. How we have used the life given to us is very necessary and important. And what will happen is that we must all come to the maturity. The maturity is what is necessary. That's what Paul said, that we may present every man perfect. Heliosus, perfect in Christ Jesus. In the next age, not every believer is going to reign with Christ. We know that. Those foolish virgins would have to go and learn and buy from the sons of oil. That's why those who have heavenly experiences tell us that, oh, there's a schooling in heaven. Different, different classes. You have to mature. You have to mature because not everyone can get into the city. But when, listen, when a thousand years ends, at that time, every single believer will be fully matured. The resurrection does not solve our immaturity problem. Problem. <laughs> you may be resurrected, yet you may have to go through schooling. Those who be in outer darkness. By the end of the thousand years, at the New Jerusalem, everyone is perfect. <laughs> everyone is perfect. That's why I say it's a blueprint of God's masterpiece. <laughs> it's God's organic blueprint and his architectural plan. The architectural plan of the triune God. The Bible says he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and whose architect is God. That city with foundations is the New Jerusalem because it is founded upon seven foot foundations. The city Abraham looked for. Whose architect? Matofara <laughs> Tastasha. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them. And he will be their God. Behold, the tabernacle of God. Is with men. So there is a bride, there is a city, and there is a tabernacle. Hmm. The city is a, is a bride to Christ, but the city is a tabernacle to God. To Christ, the city is a bride, but to God, the city is a tabernacle. <laughs> what is the use of a tabernacle? In the Old Testament, the tabernacle to come is actually a fuller development of the ancient tabernacle. And that tabernacle is God's dwelling place. The tabernacle, the tabernacle is actually, actually God's dwelling place. It's for the habitation of God. That is why the tabernacle which is a portrait of a living person. In the Old Testament, when the tabernacle was being built, God didn't use any ordinary measurements to measure the tabernacle. The tabernacle was measured with human parts. You see, when it get to the table for the show bread. It was measured with a hand breadth. That is from here to here. It was a hand breadth. The chest piece or the breast piece was measured with a span. The brazen altar was measured with a foot. It was a measurement of the spine. It was a measurement of the cubits. So God used human parts to measure the tabernacle. Because once he was assembling the tabernacle, it was man he had in mind. That's why the tabernacle was fashioned in nine months. And Christ was born from the womb in nine months. And he dwelt among us. The word dwelt in Greek is tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Grace and truth. Nine months, Christ as the living tabernacle had the body for the habitation of God, the Father. So the tabernacle, when it was fully fashioned and assembled, the glory of God descended into it. It's for the dwelling of God. So the city is for God's dwelling. It's the ultimate dwelling of God. 
is the final fulfillment, fulfillment and accomplishment of the prophecy that Moses, that was given to Joseph. Joseph received the greatest blessing more than everyone. That was the greatest benediction. When a son, the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob were, were present, when Moses was blessing them, he blessed Joseph with the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. So we see the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. We'll come there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the tabernacle is for God's dwelling. So the city is a city. Metropolis. It's a bride. It's also a tabernacle. It's a bride. What's the significance of a bride? For satisfaction, to satisfy the heart of Christ. For a sacred, unique romance with Christ. To satisfy the heart of Christ. It's a tabernacle for the dwelling of God. For God has sought. It's God's perfect abode. His permanent residence. Forever. Hallelujah. The new Jerusalem. And verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these are the true, these, are, these, these, are, these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a test of the fountains of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. He shall be my son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and liars shall have their part in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Verse 9. And there came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. One of the seven angels, which had the, the seven vials full of the last seven plagues. Hmm. Why one of them? Why should one of them come in the New Jerusalem? Hmm. It shows us that even the seven bowls was a means for the New Jerusalem. <laughs> they were part of God's package. <laughs> the seven bowls are the last great seven full judgments. Upon the seal, to seal up everything for the new Jerusalem. This is for the new Jerusalem. To a great and a high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, from here we are going to the description of the city very well, proper. Now, this angel took him to a very great and a high mountain and showed him the holy Jerusalem. When you read the Bible, even the geographical location for the vision is very important. Why a great and a high mountain? Why, why should he take him to a great and a high mountain? If he was in his room, couldn't he have showed him the vision? <laughs> Why a great and a high mountain? When Jesus was about to speak of the things concerning the future, you remember that he took the disciples into the Mount, Mount Olivet and showed them the things to come in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Hmm. Ezekiel saw a vision, visions concerning the future upon the mountaintop. Why the mountaintop? In order to see the panoramic views of the order of events in the eternities, he had to be on the top of a mountain. Now look at John. For John to see the church, the seven golden candlesticks, John was in Patmos. <laughs> the, the isolated of Patmos. Patmos is a separated place. 
It was a he needed a, a concentrated and a consecrated vision from God. So there was a separation. Before he saw the reality of the church, that the church before God is actually a golden menorah, a golden lampstand with the twelve seven fold flaming spirits, which are the seven spirits of God. When he saw all the composition of the church, he had to be separated in a place apart to see the church. For John to see Mystery Babylon, he had to be in a wilderness. Because with Mystery Babylon before God is a wilderness. <laughs> it has nothing to do with fruitfulness. <laughs> it's not even a desert, it's a wild. It's a wilderness. <laughs> That's why he saw the Mystery Babylon. To show us the state of Babylon. He took him to Patmos. It was an island separated. You know, an island is in the midst of the waters. In the Bible, water stands for the nations and the multitude. Showing us that the churches are part from the world. He has to be in an island to see the golden lampstands. He had to be on the top of a mountain. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beloved, not until you get into an elevated plane in God, God will not give you a panoramic view of what is to come. For us to, to see what is to come, for us to labor and see glorious prophecies in the ordinary plane and linger around and see, it's a lie. The Holy Ghost will, will not show you. It's not the Holy Ghost, it's an evil ghost. <laughs> he will not show you anything like that. <laughs> or you have to come to the top of the mountain. Don't be at the base of the mountain. Leave the base of the mountain. The sordid atmosphere of the modern life. And let's go to the heights of Mount Zion. Where the dew falls freshest and the wind blows purest. Where there is the crisping atmosphere, the rarefied atmosphere of the triune God. Where fellowship with God is sweet and divine. Hallelujah. The mountaintops, where you can deep see the deep blue dome of the glory of God, closer to the height of a sanctuary. <laughs> and he began to show you the things to come in a clear view, crystal view, crystal vision. They will be at the top of the mountain. And saviors shall come upon the top of Mount Zion, not the base of Mount Zion. They shall judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the laws. Deliverers, judges, and saviors are upon the top of Mount Zion. The top of the mountain. Oh, in Mount Zion, the Israelites were at the base of the mountain. The elders were at the top of the mountain. The 70 elders were at the top of the, of the mountains. They dined with God. But Moses was at the topmost section of the mountain. And he received lively oracles. And dined with God. And his face shone. And he wished not that his face was shining. Let's be at the top of the mountains. Hallelujah. It is at that time. Oh. Praise God. Those who get there. When he came to us, he wrote Genesis 1 verse 1. But he was not born. <laughs> because he had been at the top of the mountain. <laughs> 